I've featured remote control receivers from eBay in the past, but this one was a bit more interesting because it is described in the listing as 433 megahertz, that's a common frequency here for the remote controls. 50 meter relay receiver high current for working modes or household appliances. But most interestingly of all, it has a picture of the inside and that picture shows a big fat 30 amp relay. I say 30 amps, I mean Chinese 30 amps. We don't really know what they are. So I'll show you how to program this. I'll plug it in now. Things worth mentioning. It does have the little flap at the bottom covering the terminals like many power supplies. Always treat this with precaution. It's not suitable for just open handling while it's plugged in. But this one is an extra surprise. Because that picture showed a buck regulator, this antenna here should be regarded as potentially being live at mains voltage. Just keep that in mind if you're working the vicinity of one of these, particularly because you have to go in and push the button this side to actually program it. Right, I'm going to plug it in now. And the thing does indeed have four modes. It's got uh, moment reaction, it's got toggle on, toggle off, and it's got the uh, two button on off, plus various single button time delays. Now, if you press and hold this button, see I just brushed against that, so easy to do. If you press and hold this button, I don't know if this is going to be visible. Let's zoom in, see if it happens, if it is visible. There's a little green LED in here. And after a while, if I hold the button, it starts flashing. You did probably didn't see that because it is extremely dim and it's viewed in the side. After it started flash on and off, that's it clear in the codes. Now, if I want to program this to moment traction, I press the button once. After a while, it lights up continuously. I push the button, it goes out, and now it's in moment traction mode. So as long as I push the button, the relay switches on. If I want to put it into toggle on, toggle off mode, you press the button twice, it blinks once each time, then it stays on, it's waiting for the button to be pressed. It stored it, now it's toggle on, toggle off. If you want the two button on off, like say for instance this remote, you pick this up gingerly, it'd be better mounting the panel, uh, and you press it three times, one, two, three, and then you press the first button, and then the light will stay on, it wants to see the second button, and then it will be in toggle on, toggle off, but with two separate buttons. The final mode, and let's program it to one of these switch plates. I shall zoom out for this. This is a standard wall mounting switch plate. It takes a lithium cell, it's just like one of these remotes, but goes in your wall. And you can use it to control lights around your house and stuff like that if you wish. But in this case, let's put it into mode four, which I think is five seconds. So one, oh, one, two, three, four. And now it's waiting for a button. Let's assign it to that one. And now when I press that, if I've done this right, it should go on for five seconds. One, two, three, four, five, and then cut out. The other modes are 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and 20 seconds. Uh, it's worth mentioning, someone thought that maybe if you press it multiple times, it'll just add up. So if this is five seconds, one, two, three, theoretically that would be 15 seconds, but in reality, no. It's just five seconds. Okay, now we've seen all the modes, let's take it apart. These are quite nice. They're not that expensive. Uh, it is a way of automating, adding extra switches around your house. You also get these that can control uh, plug-in wall outlets with the standard RF without any of the fancy Wi-Fi connectivity. Let's get a screwdriver, making sure this is unplugged and we'll pop the cover off it. The software tends to come in two variants in these. Either the continuous hold and the LED starts blinking resets all the codes or eight button clicks press resets all the codes. Ooh. Oh, okay. What have we got? Discharges, capacitors. Just in case, well, you never know. Mm, yeah, that's dead now. There's a big fat relay. It's got a QC past sticker on it. Lovely. And it says it's J-H-I-Z-C-L-L or G-H-Z-C. Oh, God, God knows. It's, it's an unpronounceable name. I'm not sure of that brand. Uh, I'll, we'll take a look at that afterwards. Um, here's a little button. And there's the very dull LED sticking up. Let me 
zoom down. Actually, you know what? Do you know what would be better? I'll take a picture of this and we can uh, explore it. But the first thing I'm noticing here is that they've tried to tin these big pads for extra thickness, but uh, it's not taking a lot of solder. That's possibly a failure point, but something that can be upgraded. Uh, that looks like a power supply chip. That looks like a regulator. That looks like the remote control decoder chip. There's a the little module. Okay, let's open it up. Well, we've all got it open. Let's take the pictures and reverse engineer it. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is complete. Let's explore. This image is flipped over. This is the top of the circuit board. I flipped it over to make it easy for tracing things out. But we have the terminals. We have this big relay. Now, it's a ZHZCLL relay, but notice the H is that sort of dot, as if it's an I. I found other relays that didn't have that dot. Is this a clone of a clone? I'm not really sure, but it seems a standard relay. I did peel the label off it. Uh, the incoming supply has a fusible resistor. It's got some diodes associated with the power supply. It's got a metal oxide varistor down here. Let me zoom in just a little tiny bit. That would be good. A bit more? A bit too much? Nah, that's good enough. And then it's got two smoothing capacitors here. It's effectively only got a single diode rectifier. And then it's got an inductor to actually add a bit of filtering. Then it's got a switching chip on the other side, an inductor here, and a capacitor for a 12-volt supply. There is a regulator and then a capacitor for a 5-volt supply. And then the little RF receiver module. The relay is run at 12 volts. The uh, RF module and the processor will run at 5 volts. And there's a little green LED and the button. They skimped out an LED a little bit, I think, but not to worry. Let me just zoom out a tiny bit because the rest of the circuitry is just a little bit bigger. So here is the other side. Now, things worthy of note. The This could do with actually being beefed up. I'm not sure why it's so... It looks very crusty. It looks very lead-free, so to speak. That could be beefed up. I'm not, if you had a really high current application, I'm excited that I wouldn't recommend using these at super high current. If you had any intermittency issues, it could be worth reflowing the big solder connections because they are always prone to sort of cracking um, in manufacture like this. I wonder how much this was hand soldered versus the uh, the SMD flow soldering, uh, the reflow soldering. Not sure. I wonder if things like the capacitors on the other side were soldered by hand. It just kind of makes sense. But I'm not really sure the process they'd have used here. Anyway, here's the incoming supply. Uh, there are the diodes I was talking about, the little uh, metal oxide varistor. Um, there are the smooth capacitors and the inductor and this little chip here, which is... What was that again? That is a PN... Hold on. Let me just grab my notes here. It's good because I flipped a, a, over to another page in the schematic. It's a PN8015. Very simple little chip. Well, I say simple. It's super complex inside, but it makes a power supply very simple. And there's a capacitor for the 12-volt uh, the supply feedback circuit. There's a 5-volt uh, regulator for the microcontroller, which does have custom text on it, but it is just a microcontroller that's been custom programmed for this application. I wonder if that's stolen software from someone's own project, because all these units uh, seem to use the same basic software. There's a transistor that switches the relay. It's worth mentioning. These are the relay connections here. They've also included another section here that it's possible they've allowed this same module to use a smaller relay for cheaper applications with other connections on the uh, board. Probably one connection here and one connection over there. I'm not sure. Uh, but there's the back EMF diode for that, uh, and that is more or less it. Let's look at the schematic. I shall zoom down to fill the screen with this. This is just a power supply section that generates a 12 volt supply. The incoming supply of live has the relay contact, so the live is switched to from live in to live out, and the two neutral connections are common. What's really odd here is that on that module, normally with the applications like that, you'd find they'd just say the neutral that's common. They'd put them in the two middle connections. They'd bridge them together uh, with the shortest track possible. But they've actually gone sort of live, neutral, live, neutral across the connections. Here is the fusible resistor, 10 ohm. There is the metal oxide varistor. There is, normally I just expect this diode for the circuitry, and that's all that's shown in the schematic of this actual uh, regulator chip. But they've also included another little diode here. 
Not sure why they did that, but they did. There's the filtering. Uh, a couple of 4.7 microfarad 400 volt death beam capacitors and a 1 millihenry inductor, which is quite a high value. Those are normally measured in microhenry, so it's effectively, it's got brown, black, red, 1,000, 1,000 microhenries is 1 millihenry. There is the magical PN8015. Now, notice the connections in this are marked as SW for switch, because that's the one that's actually switching down to the its ground connection. But its ground connection is not actually ground ground. I think that's because this is a versatile chip that can be used in various configurations. And it has its own, it derives its own internal supply. It's got a little capacitor connected VDD to its own ground. And then it's got a feedback sensor, which is 2.5 volts. And in normal operation, it will switch, allow current to flow down through here, the positive supply to flow down through here. The inductor will impede its flow, uh, limit it to charge up this capacitor. Then, once it uh, has put a, a certain amount of current through that, built up the magnetic field, it turns off. And then the magnetic field collapses. This end was positive, this end was negative. Now this end is positive, this end is negative. And the collapsing field also charges the capacitor via this little diode, which is a fairly standard configuration. The voltage is monitored by this diode coming from here, uh, the positive supply, 12 volt supply. And it goes up to the a filter circuitry. It's got the divider here, voltage divider, and the little smoothing capacitor for stability. And these values of resistor means that when this gets up to just over 12 volts, that's to allow for the diode drop as well, it will reach 2.5 volts and that's when it cuts back and it just holds at a stable 12 volts. I have missed something off this. I've missed something off this schematic. It's that. Uh, 332. 3, 3, and 2 zeros. 3... K3. It's a little shunt resistor across that for stability. That's all right. So that is the power supply. Now we look at the receiver. The circuitry is all very straightforward after that. The 12 volt supply comes in and goes straight to the positive of the relay coil. Well, one end of the relay coil. There is a Y1 transistor. It's an NPN transistor and it switches the relay down to the zero volt rail here. Uh, there is a diode across the relay because when you turn a relay on and this end is pulled negative and this is, end is positive, uh, it builds up the magnetic field just like the power supply inductor but at a larger scale. And then when the transistor turns off, because it's effectively open circuit and that magnetic field collapses without this diode, you'd get a very high voltage spike. Effectively, this end would go positive with respect to that and it can damage the transistor. So they put a diode across it and that means that when the really turns off that spike of the collapsing field is shunted by the diode. The 12 volt supply goes to the 5 volt voltage regulator to create the 5 volt supply. I'd rather than draw the tracks right down to the bottom, these little blocks here indicate the 0 volt rail. Uh, there is, I'm guessing, a 100 meg fired capacitor. Let me show you that on the schematic, on the drawing actually, should I say. That's the one that's stuffed there and just by the way it's landed, the text is right against the relay. So I'd have to take that out to measure it, but uh, or even read it. I'm going to guess 100 meg for 25 volts. It's not going to be a massively high value. And it supplies the microcontroller along with the decoupling capacitor and the RF receiver module. I haven't reverse engineered the RF receiver module. I've done that in other videos. But that just basically demodulates the signal it receives and it sends data to the microcontroller. There is just... Uh, an LED with a 3K resistor, that's the very dim LED. It's not really surprising with 3K, but that's also possible because there is a programming port in this. There's a 4-pin programming port, uh, 5 volts, 0 volts, and then a connection to 3, which also goes to that LED, and uh, a connection to 5, which also goes to the button. Um, I'm guessing maybe that's why the LED resistor value is so high to stop bits are clamping down the uh, programming pulses. But that's more or less it. The microcontroller, when it gets the appropriate data and it stores in its non-volatile memory, could be a pic 12 type thing, it controls the relay via this 4K7 resistor to the base of it. That is it. So it's a nice enough little relay. It's a fairly logical design. Uh, I put it down somewhere. There it is. It's a chunky little thing. 
Kyle, 12 volt DC, 30 amp, 240 volts AC, but that will depend on the type of load you're switching. And to be honest, I'm not sure I'd trust it with 30 amps. But there we have it. Uh, it works. Um, whether you trust it is the usual thing for imported things, but it could certainly act as a hackable base. Oh, other things you could do. Since it's already converting to a 12 volt DC supply, you could, technically speaking, uh, adapt this to operate at 12 volts DC by using... Oh, where is that? Let's take a look at the structure. Oh, that's the last page of my uh, notebook. On to the next notebook. It is. Let me just take a look at this. How would you convert 12 volt DC? Well, there's already a diode to the zero volt rail. You could leave that 10 ohm resistor in. So this could be, the neutral could be used as the negative. Uh, and the, you could take uh, a link from the incoming positive supply directly over to the 12 volt uh, connection here on this, uh, on the capacitor. I'm not sure if the, I'm not sure if the circuitry would be too miffed by that. That's this capacitor here, which would be Any of these weird red connections here, actually, you could take it over to one of these pads since they are the plus 12 volt. Um, but you could theoretically adapt it. I'm not sure if that would upset this little chip or not, if it would do anything weird. Um, but that is viable. But there we have it. Uh, interesting little unit. I shall put it back together. I can't really think of a use for it, but it is interesting. And I like the fact that, you know, you get this modular approach. These all come programmed with different codes that it's unlikely you're going to get a code conflict even in a fairly well populated area but if you do just buy another remote it's probably the easiest way around that but there we have it the high current remote control from ebay